Coming up, we'll talk with two survivors of breast cancer and take a look at some new developments in the early detection of the disease. Later in the show, Zydeco and blues musician Major Handy will tell us about a mythical beast called a wolf couchant on today's edition of Folks. <laughs> I'm Sonia Massengale. Breast cancer is the second leading cause of cancer deaths in the United States. The words alone strike fear into the hearts of most women. Breast cancer can kill, yet millions of American women avoid examining their own breasts for fear of finding something. We'll discuss breast self-examination and take a look at some of the refinements in the early detection of breast cancer. But first, we talked with two survivors of the disease. Through their experience, we learn that there can be life after breast cancer. Malvia Albert, mother of three, now has two grandchildren. Her breast cancer was discovered during a routine visit to her gynecologist. I went to my gynecologist for a regular checkup, and he discovered the lump in my breast. He sent me downstairs for x-rays, and um, they discovered that it was something. They never told me that it was cancer. They kept telling me all along that I didn't have cancer, that I was going to be all right, that everything was all right. But they moved me rather fast. I went to my gynecologist around the 1st of August, and by 20, the 22nd of August, I had had the surgery. I had discovered that I had cancer, and at that point, I thought I was fixing to die. I was ready to die. Not really ready to die, but I thought I was. I thought that with cancer there was no chance that you simply got cancer and the next step was that you were dead. Charlene Hand has two children. She discovered her own breast cancer by accident. Following a breast injury, I had a discharge, so I was recommended to seek a surgeon's care. And at that time, a mammogram was done, which was essentially negative, with... Um, the only evidence was that of a blood clot at the, at the area of the injury. But I remained under the physician's care for several months just for observational purposes. And within two months, a lump developed. And at that time, a biopsy was recommended. And then I requested the physician at the time the biopsy was done, if it were positive, to do the mastectomy at the same time. It's been nine years, August 22nd. One of the things you never forget. Malvia and Charlene agree that facing a cancer death was more devastating than losing a breast. My facing breast cancer was not as difficult as me facing the fact that I had cancer. I think just having cancer, a diagnosis of cancer, throws you into some, a fearful situation, somewhat fearful. But the, um, facing a life-threatening situ situation dealing with cancer was not as difficult was more difficult for me than facing the breast cancer and the physical changes that result from breast surgery. It never crossed my mind not to have the surgery. My concern at that time were my children, my son especially, who was 11 years old at the time. I kept wondering what was going to happen with him. What was your recovery like? My family pampered me. They really pampered me. Everybody pampered me. I, uh, I let them. I let them. I, uh, I don't like pain. My arm hurt all of the time. I cried half of the time. And, but I had a lot of good friends. A lot of people were praying for me, and a lot of people, 
every day I had visitors, somebody would come by, your mother included. They would um, bring me things or something to read, and uh, my children wanted me to get well. My husband wanted me to get well. And uh, one day while I was sitting there feeling sorry for myself, I said, now, if all of these people want me to get well, why don't I want it for myself? So um, I had friends to come in and help me walk the walls so that I could use my arm again, reach to recovery. And uh, because at a point they had told me to brush my hair and it hurt and I didn't want to do that. I just didn't want to do anything they told me to do. Because as I say, I think still in the back of my mind, I thought I was going to die. I, like you, was afraid of dying. I didn't know how long I was going to live. And the breast surgery and the changes involved didn't scare me as much as the cancer did. I knew after the surgery, I had a lot of things I still wanted to do. And I was visited by a Reach to Recovery volunteer, as Malvia was talking about. And with her help and the support of other people, I knew I wanted to get back out and start doing things quickly. I was a little quicker in my recuperation than Malvia was. I was back at work in about six weeks. Sure, it's bad, and I wished I hadn't had it, but it's not the end of the world, and I'm going to survive, aren't we, Charlene? We certainly are. We've survived this long, and we've got a long way to go. Yeah. Lots of things to do. Was there a time when you really had to face the loss of the breast? My husband was my strength. He kept he built my confidence every day. He told me that a breast was nothing, that he loved me, not the breast. I was the important person, not the breast. And um, one night when we were going to a dance in um, December, this was my first attempt at going to a party or anything, I selected this slow cut dress that was going to come on down. So he got ready. I put the dress on, and of course I couldn't wear it because all of these scars were showing. So I sat down and I cried, and I cried for about an hour. The children would come and peep in the window, in the door. Mama, don't cry. So finally, <laughs> somebody said, maybe it's a neat on us. Mama, why don't you put on another dress? Which I did. <laughs> I went, I looked very pretty, I had a nice time, <laughs> and I did. I went through a period where I did not want anybody to know I had breast cancer. I did not want them to know. I was so self-conscious about it. And, um, but going to reach to recovery, that helped me. That is a tremendous program for women who've had breast cancer. Did either of you consider breast reconstruction surgery? Um, I have thought about reconstruction. But I am hesitant about undergoing surgical procedures that are not absolutely necessary. And up until this point, I don't really feel a need to have reconstruction and to undergo another surgery. I've known several women who have had reconstruction and are really happy with the results. But my decision at this time is not to have reconstruction. I like Melvin and happy with the way I am and just happy with the way things are going. Malvia has two daughters and one granddaughter. She makes certain that they are aware of their increased risk of breast cancer. My girls, I suggest to them that they have the yearly checkup because the risk is now very high for them. Then I have a granddaughter, and I will hope that when the time comes, we will be able to instill it into her to have the um, checkups as um, often as necessary. In fact, um, when my son bring young ladies by the house, I even ask them, you know, have you had the breast checkup and this kind of thing? Because I do feel that with the early treatment, the chances for survival are stronger. My suggestion to women is to do regular self-breast exam to pay attention to any symptom that your body gives you. Sometimes there's just a little something that you feel is not right. Talk to your physician about it. Don't always wait for him to find it or 
wait for a diagnostic procedure to find it. If you feel something is wrong, seek advice. Early detection of breast cancer can mean saving a life as well as a breast. A recent survey found that 68% of all breast cancers were found by women themselves, 57% by accident, 21% by breast self-examination. Of the women surveyed, only 27% actually said that they examined their breasts every month. Young women are more likely to examine themselves than older women, yet the risk of developing breast cancer is much greater after age 50. White women are more likely to examine their breasts than black women, although black women die more often from breast cancer. Breast self-examination is very simple. First examine your breasts in front of a mirror. It's normal for one breast to be slightly larger than the other, but if the change is recent, it should be reported. Now for the skin. Is there flaking or scaling? Any variation in texture should be noticed and any cracking or discharge from the nipple. Then lie down with one hand behind your head. With the other hand, fingers flatten, gently feel your breast. Press lightly, reverse hands and examine the other breast. Repeat the same process sitting up, one hand behind your head. Other early detection procedures can be performed in the doctor's office in addition to a routine breast exam. A thermogram is a picture of the heat patterns of the breast. A heat pattern is like a fingerprint. It does not change over the years. A thermogram requires no radiation and can be done frequently. A doctor using it can determine even very small abnormalities in the breast. A mammogram is a low-dose x-ray of the breast. It is probably the most accurate diagnostic tool available. Mammogram machines have become so refined that the technician no longer wears a leaded apron during the procedure. With modern technology, a woman can have this procedure performed often without fear of overexposure to radiation. The mammogram on the left side of the screen indicates cancer. The one on the right side of the screen shows a dense but normal breast. This procedure is called a spectra scan. It involves no radiation. A light probe is positioned under and around the breast. The pictures of the spectra scan are videotaped. This procedure is very helpful in locating abnormalities in very young women. Ultrasound is also used in the early detection of breast cancer. Sound waves are used to produce a picture of the tissues of the breast. A final word, your risk of developing breast cancer is greater if you are 50 years of age or older, you are Caucasian, you have a family history of breast cancer, you have not given birth to a child. Remember, finding a lump is not the worst that can happen. Nine out of 10 breast lumps are harmless. Here to answer more of our questions about breast cancer are Redeem Parsons, a volunteer for Reach to Recovery, an organization for breast cancer survivors, and Dr. Gregory Harrison, surgeon and breast health specialist. Welcome to folks. Thank you. Greg, Breast self-examination can be pretty frightening. Uh, it's time-consuming. To some women, it might even seem sinful to touch themselves in that way. And your reward for finding something is usually losing a breast. What are the alternatives to mastectomy? Well, uh, first of all, you have to uh, get rid of a, a lot of old things about examining yourself. Um, one of the things that uh, being involved just uh, with breast patients and breast cancer, the thing you try to get patients to do is examine themselves and uh, try to find things early uh, before they become extensive and require radical surgery. Uh, unfortunately, the majority of women uh, that do come in uh, tend to find things early, uh, ignored for a while, uh, uh, most of the time real frightened about it. and then when they do come in, a uh, radical surgery is usually required. So uh, conservative surgery can be done for very early lesions. And the majority of the time, these are lesions, unfortunately, not the ones picked up by self-examination, but ones that can be picked up by uh, tests uh, where the, the mass or lump is not even palpable yet. So you're saying the treatment for, say, an apple seed side, sized cancer and a golf ball sized cancer are different? Yes, radically different. Uh, usually larger sized cancers uh, require the more traditional uh, radical treatment, which would be mastectomy, which means removal of the breast. Uh, the smaller cancers, which uh, fortunately more of them are being detected today, 
uh, are detected by certain tests, uh, things like mammography, which means x-ray of the breast. Uh, when these uh, lumps are picked up, uh, very conservative surgery can be done with local excision, meaning excising only that area, and usually excision of the uh, lymph nodes, which are the glands on the arm. What is that called? Uh, usually that is called a lumpectomy, re uh, meaning removal of the lump, and the axillary dissection is taking out the lymph glands on the arm. And usually with that treatment, uh, a woman is able to keep her breasts and not have to go through the uh, traditional radical treatment of removal of the entire breast. For the sake of our viewers and for myself, could you explain the difference between radiation and chemotherapy? It's something that you hear a lot about and it can be confusing. Okay. Um, radiation uh, is basically using ionizing radiation, uh, which is not unlike the uh, uh, radiation that comes from the sun, except it's a little more intense, it's concentrated. Uh, radiation in, in terms of breast cancer is usually used to provide a local control. Its indications are usually for women that choose uh, conservative surgery. Uh, what has been found uh, not only by studies in this country but also in Europe is that uh, women that have local uh, removal of the lesion, meaning taking out the lump uh, and removing the nodes, uh, tend to require radiation afterwards to provide local control because breast cancer itself tends to be what's called a multicentric disease, meaning it's in several areas of the breast. You may find a small area there, but there are also other areas around. And radiation is usually used to control those other areas in the breast. Uh, chemotherapy is usually reserved for women that have disease outside the breast. Uh, usually, uh, breast cancer tends to spread in a logical manner in some women. It does go from the lump to to more systemic areas, meaning the bones, uh, the liver, other parts of the body. Uh, chemotherapy is usually used for a more systemic type of disease. Is there anything that can be done to keep a breast cancer from developing? Uh, nothing uh, that we know of uh, in this period of time. Uh, we know certain risk factors that uh, make you more susceptible. Uh, and these are just basically things that you know. But as far as anything uh, that a woman can do in, in this day and time that we know of, there is nothing really that you can do to prevent breast cancer. Uh, How about diet and uh, things of that nature? Well, uh, breast cancer tends to be uh, more common in well-developed countries. In more undeveloped countries where we're not exposed to the diet we are and, and certain other things in the environment, breast cancer is very uncommon. I guess if people in this country and uh, some of the other countries outside the United States would uh, change their diet environment, uh, they would uh, probably be less cancer, breast cancer. However, uh, we still do not have a single factor, even though we know all these little things that probably lead to the development of breast cancer. Uh, we still do not know one thing that uh, women can stop doing as far as diet or things like that to prevent them from getting the disease. We're basically at a stage now where we have to try to pick it up early uh, before uh, it becomes more serious. The psychological impact of losing a breast, I'm sure, varies from individual to individual, but are there certain stages that most breast cancer victims go through? Um, it's uh, strange that you would ask that because uh, I found with myself uh, there were definite stages that I went through. At the time, it, it has been 10 years since I had the mastectomy. So I'm looking back now on a different stage of my life. Um, at the time, I didn't realize I was going through these stages. Uh, since that time, I have, through death, lost several very close family members. And going through the stages of grief that I went through after each of those deaths, I found that I went through those same stages after I lost a breast. I was sitting in a symposium with a nurse uh, giving a talk and she was indicating to the nurses that she was uh, directing her um, talk primarily to um, that there were stages that the patient goes through and she, and she did confirm this with me that um, 
it's basically the same as a death. You go through a denial, uh, anger, and then acceptance. Um, I guess at first, uh, my form of denial was that this really is not happening to me. It's uh, happening to someone else. I was only 41. I felt I was too young to be having something like this. Um, my children were reaching the age that they were, um, I had children in college and still some in junior high, and I felt like I should be doing other things instead of worrying about dying, and that's what I did for, I would say, two years. Um, for the first two years, uh, it seemed that everywhere I looked, I saw two things, either the word cancer or I saw cleavage. <laughs> And I saw cancer on billboards, on TV, uh, pick up the newspaper, and you know, here I had cancer, and then I would see the billboards and the TV and the magazines and see the cleavage, and I no longer had cleavage. But it did take about two years for me to accept it and to reach the point where it was not right there in front of my face every waking moment. And it, it does take a while. It's pretty devastating. Uh, Dr. Harrison, do you, you were shaking your head while she was talking. It, it's pretty common for a woman to go through those same uh, Of course, stages. it's uh, with cancer being as common as it, as it is now, it's uh, a very common thing for not only women with breast cancer, but with, with cancer in general to go through those stages. And uh, one of the things as a physician that a lot of times is you have to be very supportive. It's not the kind of thing where as a surgeon you usually treat it, you, you take it out. Uh, it's not that kind of thing. You have to be there. You have to support the patient, the family, because it's also a very traumatic uh, thing uh, for them. Do the women ever get angry at you? I know I would be angry at the sure. doctor first. That would probably be the first thing. Uh, I would it's, it's not an uncommon thing for uh, women to be angry. Uh, I would say that there are patients that not ev every woman that comes in has a very obvious breast cancer since uh, more women are seeking treatment earlier. Uh, it's a devastating thing e when you uh, tell a woman that uh, maybe one week that uh, you don't really feel it's anything, but you need to evaluate her again in maybe four to six weeks to make a decision about uh, possibly doing a biopsy, something like taking a small tissue to make a diagnosis. And then coming that, at that period of time and said, oh, well, you have breast cancer. They're angry. Why did you wait six weeks? Does that make a difference? And these stages that people go through uh, are very common. Radine, what do you do on your first visit uh, as a REACH to Recovery volunteer? We, uh, some doctors like for us to demonstrate some exercises for them. And we do that by just some little exercise aids that we have. We um, have a little piece of clothesline, which seems like a very simple thing. But we show them how to use that as a pulley and as a jump rope to uh, use to keep their shoulder uh, moving and so that they won't have a stiff shoulder. Just a little simple piece of clothesline, but we demonstrate that, that exercise. The little rubber ball we use to show them just to use in, on the surgery side, squeezing to keep the strength in that hand and arm, <clears throat> indicating several other little exercises. The thing that we most like to leave them, though, is their own breast form. They've lost a breast and they're wondering, everyone that comes in to see them in the hospital, the first thing they do, they look at their face and then look at their chest. <laughs> Whether they do it or not, you really think that they're doing that. So we have the little breast form. This one happens to be a 32. Um, we encourage the patient to pin it into her gown right away and wear this. Uh, she can wear an old bra, pin it into the bra. Um, this can be worn right away. They don't have to wait for the incision to heal. We do encourage them or tell them to be sure that they wear something over the surgery area so this is right ne not right next to the incision. But this seems to brighten up uh, their day as much as anything. Um, when the Reached Recovery volunteer came to see me, however, um, she told me, it's been three years since my surgery. Now that seems like such a short time. But when she said three years, she was giving me back my life. And really, that's what we feel like that we do. We give them hope and encouragement when we walk into that room and tell them that we have had the same surgery. I want to thank you both for being here. We've been talking to Radine Parsons and Dr. Gregory Harrison about breast cancer. 
Last week, we listened to the music of Creole musician Major Handy. We visited Royal Shield Recording Studios here in Baton Rouge to find out more about the man, his music, and the beast that inspired an album, The Wolf Couchant. Major Handy is quickly becoming a famous man. His music combines the best of all Louisiana. As with many talented musicians, he comes from modest beginnings. I went home and built my first cigar box guitar, genuine, five strings. You know, I plucked on that a long time till I realized I need to get the real thing. And I worked, picked pecans, break, broke, break okra with my uncle in the field, picked up all my little pennies, got $25 and I found a guitar for sale on the end of the road, you know, a guy wanted to sell it, looked it brand new, and I really wanted it, and I worked hard for it. And I got it. And it was, and I really liked it, and I really wanted. I said, "Well, now I'm gonna spend all this money on this guitar. I'm gonna have to learn how to play it." And I just went at it. What is your music all about? Maybe the area I live in, the people in the area I live in, uh, maybe a little bit about love. Not too, too much. Bad women. <laughs> Stuff like that. Why did you name your first album Wolf Couchon? The Wolf Couchon is that little animal that we're looking for in the wood. It's part pig and part dog. And everybody said, well, why is part pig and part dog? And then they can't understand why we come up with the name Wolf Couchon, you know? And what is that supposed to mean, you know? And we just look at him and say, well, it's greedy and it's nasty. You know, a dog is <laughs> greedy and a pig is nasty, so. That's, you know, that's how we, but we're still hoping to find that little fella. We go looking in the wood every day for him, but Man. we haven't been up. We, we haven't been able to put a hand on him yet. But we're gonna catch him, and we're gonna show him to the whole world. The Wolf Couchon's real identity is still a mystery. But here's a hint: most of them have two legs. This all started, you know, maybe two, maybe two years ago, you know, when somebody came up with this idea. And uh, this was mentioned once or twice, and the idea just got strong in my head. And, uh, and you know, we just cre created an image, you know. It's not, you know, we have never seen this such animal, but we're still looking. You know, we really are, we look it. You know, if we can do that, well, we're gonna be making a lot of money. Well, that's all for now. Next week, a look at what it takes to make a minority business a success. See you then, bye-bye. Baby